some uh, some 14 wire hooked up on a 20 amp breaker instead of a 15 amp breaker. If anything, you just put it back to a 15 amp breaker. That's the wires ran for all your plugs and your lights in your house. I'm Clifford Ray. I live in Mesa, Arizona. I'm 67 years old. I've uh, basically worked my whole life as a contractor. And growing up, my dad died at the age of uh, 34, so I never really thought much about living much longer than that. <laughs> but uh, I is working and stuff. I mean, I've always put a lot of trust in God, figured that, hey, he takes care of the birds, he can take care of me, and I, I just did what I had to do to live. And uh, I've always made good money. We've never missed a meal. And uh, I've never really worried about money because I figured, uh, you know, Social Security will pay me 40000 a year with my wife and I, and I'd always be able to work and make whatever I needed to make, and I never really thought about ever not being able to keep up with everybody. But as time goes on, these last few years, I've noticed a, a drop off in here for remembering things, and also physically, I can't do what I used to do. I used to do a patio in a day, and with just anybody helping me, and now it's a two-day job. And it's, so I, I, looking back on it, I wish I would have saved more because you know at this point in my life, I could go on an LDS mission with my wife now if I had the funds put away, but we don't. Unfortunately, Clifford's situation is not uncommon. Many retirement age individuals are not able to do the things they want to do because they don't have enough money. Many look back and wish they had saved more, that they had put more money away. This group of individuals, age 65 and older, represent 15% of the population in America. About 85% of those individuals are currently receiving Social Security benefits, providing an average income of about $17,500 per year. Two-thirds of those individuals have some amount of money saved for retirement. However, the median income from those savings is less than $1,754 per year. The research is clear. The income provided by Social Security and retirement savings is not enough. Wasn't retirement supposed to be the golden years of travel, pleasure, and enjoying the things you worked so hard for? And yet, the reality is, millions of Americans are not living the life in retirement they hoped for. Why? The 401k is the retirement plan. The average 401k was worth 104000 in the second quarter. That's up 6% from a year ago. That's a good number. That they're saving right now, but that it really won't last them through their retirement. The fact is that the typical 401k investor is a financial novice. They don't know a stock from a lot. What are the, generally the quality of the mutual funds and 401k plans? Mediocre. I feel like... You know, people just put their money in that 401k and they don't necessarily look at it and they don't necessarily really know what the plan is inv invested in. And expected to retire at a certain time and found their 401ks cut in half in 2008. The average numbers are wildly different by age. And early 50s, $155,700. So the retirement industry is a challenging one right now, I think, because there's an influx of products and financial professionals, but there's a lack of education. So many of us in, in America, we go to work and we're told that there's a retirement option. We get a 401k plan, we pick our color spectrum of, of risk, and, and then we allocate to funds that more often than not, we have no idea what they are, how they perform. Um, there's very little advice in those, those environments as well. So more often than not, I think that, that the challenge we face as Americans today is that we have a lot of choices, but no one's telling us how they compare to one another or, or what the choices uh, or what choices should be considered by an individual that's say 20 years old compared to somebody that's 62 years old and about to retire. In the nine years I've spent in the financial services industry, I'd say maybe 30% of the people I spoke to actually understood their financial situation and had any knowledge of the options available to them to help them achieve their financial goals. Again, these ideas become more complicated. Uh, they're always trying to, to one-up each other, so to speak, in terms of who's got the shinier object for retirement. But again, the challenge there is there's no education. Back in 1926, there was a guy named George Clayson, and he wrote the book, The Richest Men in Babylon, that I believe is the single most influential financial book ever written. 
It was revolutionary because it made the concepts of money and wealth extremely simple. His number one advice was to pay yourself first, that you work hard and part of your money was yours to keep to get working for you. So if you're willing to put your money aside first, not last, because we're always taught to pay ourselves last. But George Clayson came out and said, no, you remain poor because you do it backwards. Pay yourself first. Then with the remaining money, live your life. This was the first step to the evolution of wealth in the US. Then Albert Einstein came into the picture. Einstein was quite famous in the 30s and 40s, and he was really heavy on the power of compounding. Einstein is credited for calling compound interest the greatest mathematical discovery of all time, the eighth wonder of the world, but added, he who understands it earns it. Compound interest is money that makes money for you, and then the money that money makes also makes money. So now if you're willing to pay yourself first, where do you put your money? A compound interest account. That was the next evolution of money. Then in 1975, there's a guy named John Bogle, and he's the founder of Vanguard. Bogle had the idea that what if you approached money with the mentality of slow and steady wins the race? Get the average, but make it the lowest cost possible. So now you have the most amount of money working for you rather than paying the heavy fees of a financial advisor. Bogle is considered the father of the index fund and launched his first index fund in 1975. An index fund is a large collection of stocks. One more common is the S&P 500 index. It's 500 companies that you're invested in, all 500, so it kind of spreads out your risk. Because it's really easy to manage, John Bogle could charge less than everyone else, get the average of the top 500 companies, and produce the best results. He wasn't liked at first, but the math has shown us over the last 45 years, it's actually outperformed the majority of investors and money managers. Then 1979 happened, and that was a good year because a guy named Ted Bennett was researching the 401k. The 401k a lot of people don't realize is just an IRS tax code that explains you can put in deferred tax money to an investment that could be used for retirement, let it compound, and then get taxed later. Ted Bennett was a good man because he noticed only around one third of Americans had pensions, and two third of Americans didn't have any retirement planning at all or little access to any type of retirement plan that was simplified. So this was a big advancement in how to build wealth for everyday Americans. So here's how it works. First, you choose to be a part of the plan. And by so doing, you choose to elect a portion of your paycheck, usually a percentage of your paycheck, uh, each, each week or each two weeks, that is taken from your paycheck and put into the 401k plan. It also allows for businesses to add money to your account called a match as a benefit to the employee. That contribution plus their, the employer match is put into your investment. And over time, you're hoping that investment continues to grow for you and that that is what would someone would consider your nest egg. As that continues to grow and grow, then when you get to your retirement age, that's at the point that you're looking to now take that money and live on it. Using data from the last 35 years of returns in the S&P 500. If you started in 1984, using today's average household income of $50,000 a year, contributing 6% of your salary and receiving a 3% company match, for a total of $4,500 each year into your 401k plan, your balance after 35 years would be approximately $818,000. At this point, you will be withdrawing money to live on, and the industry accepted safe withdrawal rate is 4%. At 4%, you will be able to withdraw $32,700. Then Uncle Sam will take his cut in the form of income taxes, which, using today's rate of 12%, means that after tax, your $818,000 balance will produce you an annual retirement income of $28,800. Now here's the sad truth. The average 401k balance for Americans aged 60 to 69 is $182,100. The after tax income on that balance would be approximately $6,500 a year. Everyone ends up poor. I wrestled at Arizona State University as on scholarship there. I love wrestling. I was a three-sport athlete in high school. While I was at ASU, I was down in a basement one time playing ping pong with one of my friends. And his older brother came downstairs and said, guys, we should totally start a granite countertop business. And I said, dude, I got an $8,000 scholarship check. I will totally invest in that. What's granite? Everyone laughed. I had never met someone with granite. That was pretty much only for rich people. But I soon fell in love with natural stone, granite, quartz, marble, all the different stones. It was fascinating to me on how natural stone worked, how you could take something that was rough and ugly, polish it up and make it extremely beautiful. So after about six months, I decided I want to start a granite countertop business. The other guys kind of fizzled out. That's what most people do. They have a good idea and then they just don't capitalize on it or they're unwilling to work it. 
I became obsessed with granite countertops, started researching it 12 hours a day on where granite came from, how to import it, how kitchens are designed, and other standard things, and noticed some big inefficiencies in the granite industry that I felt I could fix. So I ended up designing a product called a prefabricated countertop that hadn't really been introduced to the United States yet. It's how you pre-cut granite and bring it in certain stock sizes, already finished, ready to install. We were able to be much more efficient than everyone else. It was my advantage because we imported all these pre-cut pieces in different sizes and different colors, and were able to install kitchens really quickly, making a lot of money and still costing less than everyone else in the market. We grew our kitchen business from two kitchens a week to over 20 in less than one year. I was 23 years old making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and I didn't even know what to do with it. I grew up not knowing very much about money. I had eight siblings, so there really wasn't a lot of money left over when my parents paid the bills. Uh, because I was making so much money and had no idea how to manage money, I lent a lot of money to family and friends. I lost a lot of money in stupid investments. I was like, I'll invest in anything. I'm an entrepreneur, that's what I do. It's pretty easy to make money, but no one ever teaches how to keep money. Uh, Curtis has a story that he'll tell people that I like to shove money away and, and save money. And when we were first married and we did a ton of granite work and we made a ton of money in a short period of time, I would stash cash away under the mattress type of a thing. And one day I came to him and I was like, so I may have stashed too much money. And when I told him, he flipped out. He was like, what, you're hiding this money from me? I'm like, it's our savings. But since that, I took that money, put it in a savings account and we just saved it. And he, every day he's like, so I have a new business idea. Can I take that money? No, you cannot have that money. It's our savings. As time went on over the next 10 years, we grew to a very large business. In 2012, I met an investor. He was one of my clients and he said, Curtis, what impedes you from not being a $50 million business? Why are you capped out at like $5 million of revenue? I never really crossed that $5 million mark. And I said, it's because I like to do everything myself. I was just a one man show. He went on and pitched me the idea that what if we take my business, my ideas, my concepts, my understanding of efficient ways to install kitchens and turn it into a really big business. And as an entrepreneur, what do I love to do? Make more money. So I said, yeah, let's do this. I formed a 50-50 partnership with this investor. It went so well. Like we went from $5 million to $10 million in less than 12 months. We we're doing over 60 kitchens a week. Everything was going crazy. We we're making so much money. Then Armageddon happened. So many businesses go through this business happened. You know, you have a partnership dispute, a lawsuit, this or that. There are a million things that happen in business that can blow it up in a blink of an eye. Mine just happened to be I partnered with a person I didn't know very well and I was a very unsophisticated entrepreneur like most of us are and him being an investor and very savvy and experienced, well, uh, he ended up using my partnership agreement to basically take the business from us and we lost everything. I was very involved in the granite business, still involved in the granite business. It was devastating. I mean, we had worked so hard and so long to build this great thing, and it just took, um, unfortunately, a partner to destroy it, to disagree with us. It was devastating because this was a business I'd built for 10 years. It was my baby, I loved it. It was everything I did. I was working 14 hour days. It's what I loved to do, so it was never work. Uh, when we ended up having our division and threats started happening and lawyers got involved, uh, very quickly accounts were frozen, but I still had clients and I loved my clients and I loved my employees and I did everything I could to make sure the business was taken care of. And so I ended up starting paying money out of my pocket using my own savings so that the business was floated over this time frame. And until that day, November 1st of 2014, I realized I ran out of money. My business that I created for 10 years was being taken from me. It was the worst night of my life. Uh, it was Halloween night, I remember very clearly. I took the kids out trick-or-treating, went back to the house, just put them to bed, and I didn't sleep that night. It, it felt like, I don't even know how to describe it because it's that moment where like, everything I did for 10 straight years was gone. I went in there to the granite company to see if we could buy it back um, from our investor and uh, just looking at the books and what had gone on and um, there's just no way to save it and we decided to let it go uh, and we lost a ton of money. Went from a lot of money in my bank account to almost nothing. Married, five kids, no job, no business. What am I gonna do now? So when the company crashed and we lost everything, um, I said, it's time to pull out that savings. We've got to start a new business. And he's like, we are young. We can do this. If this happened when we were 60, it, um, 
it would have been devastating for us because to start over at 60, you just don't have the energy to do it. And so although I had no money, no business, a wife and five kids to feed, the surprising thing is that feeling of despair and devastation I felt, it only lasts for around 12 hours. I ended up getting up the next morning and I didn't feel scared. It was kind of weird and actually really hard to explain, but I was actually kind of excited. <laughs> I could do all the things I love to do and eliminate the bad things I learned over time that were just like kind of part of the business. So once my non-compete expired, we restarted the business and uh, within one year we were rolling again. I ended up making more money in 2015 than any year previous and more in 2016 than 15 and uh, we just continued to grow. We built up our, our business again. Luckily our name was still out there. People knew who we were, knew we did good work, uh, honest work, and we were able to build it. Um, really, really fast. And when I tell my story, people always say, well, wow, that's a terrible story. But I always say, no, that was the most important day of my life because that was the day I decided I would never be vulnerable to money again. I was going to dedicate my life to be the world's expert, not on how you make money, because anyone can teach you how to make money, but how you keep money and get that money working for you as securely as possible. So after the business fiasco, I realized we can't rely on our businesses anymore. He decided to just dive into research. Um, him and his brother had dabbled into um, what's considered MPI right now. So I met Curtis five years ago when he came into our, our brokerage to talk about what they had discovered in a life insurance contract. Curtis actually had his own life insurance and it was asking questions and trying to explore ways that he could optimize the performance of it. Um, and they actually came in and presented to us an idea that they had that was the foundation of what eventually became MPI. In 1997, something really cool happened in the retirement space and that's the insurance world decided they wanted to make a product that had security built into compound interest. The insurance world designed a product called an indexed universal life, known as an IUL, a hybrid insurance contract that had some great guaranteed security features and growth potential similar to the stock market. A nice balanced strategy. Although the IUL has its flaws, it's not perfect. It has a very special feature called the 0% floor, meaning in any given year, the worst return you can get is 0% basically eliminating the risk of stock market while also being able to achieve a great compound interest return when the market does well. So in 2008, when everyone lost up to 50% of their 401k IRA, the IUL got a 0% return. As I began to research the IUL, I learned very quickly it's a good plan, but also had some really big flaws that I thought I could fix. So I was gonna create the IUL 2.0, the granite guy turned finance. Uh, what's interesting about that is I turned them away. I said, there's too many problems with this idea and, and I presented sort of the holes in the, in the thought process. Eric basically said there's no way some guys in Mesa, Arizona with no insurance experience discovered something new inside of a life insurance contract. He was like, Curtis, I do this every day for the last 20 years. You have a bunch of flaws in your idea, although it's a really cool idea, but maybe if you can fix those flaws, it might work. But trust me, it's impossible. And I do that, typically these, these people who come to me with ideas, they disappear, right? They don't go fix the problems, they just take it as a challenge and, and they walk away from it. So for the next four years, I went at it, addressing every single problem Eric pointed out. I became obsessed to fix the first version of the MPI concept. I'd message Eric every six months or so saying, hey, I'll be back, don't forget about me. Then on November 5th of 2017, I called him up and said, Eric, I'm done, it's finished. The crazier part about this story is on November 2nd, I actually gave up. Four years of working on this. It might be the first time in my whole life that I ever gave up on something I really wanted. So I called up Eric and I basically broke up with him saying, hey, there's no way to finish this. I'm really sorry for wasting your time. Then I went to my wife and told her, hey, it's impossible. Basically apologize for all the time and money I just wasted. And uh, can you guess what she said to me? She said, no, go finish it, Curtis. You're not done. So guess what I did? I went back to work. I basically didn't sleep for the next 72 hours, went through everything over and over and over again and call it divine intervention or the universe or whatever you want. But what happened in those three days is a pretty freaking crazy story. Uh, that's for another day. But all of a sudden, something I looked at for four years, everything in a single moment came together right in front of me. I, I got a phone call and he said, I've corrected everything that you talked about, are you ready to change the world? I thought at one point I had figured everything out there was to figure out about Index Universal Life and I considered myself to be very educated on the subject, but MPI took that to a whole nother level. And, and it's unique in that it's addressed a lot of the things that we saw being somewhat problematic with IULs too, because everything you do for retirement 
has some element of risk to it, right? So with life insurance, there's there's a cost for the insurance component. You're buying a life insurance contract, so you have a little bit of an element of risk in terms of what that cost could be. Um, so what MPI did is it, it started plugging some of those holes to where we can sustain you know, uh, low years or low return years for a longer period of time and have the same positive net results that we hope to have in the first place had we not had 0% returns in, in these products. And so MPI, again, it was it was something that opened my eyes up to what you can really do with these products and, and these contracts to maximize the value for the consumer. When I called Eric and told him that it was finished, he obviously wanted to see it for himself. Uh, he felt it was still impossible. So I went to his office and one by one explained the solutions we had discovered to the various flaws. He took some time to fact check it as I just made the claim the MPI life insurance contract could actually produce much better results than the 401k or Roth IRA. So after some due diligence and a few choice swear words, he turned to me and gave me a look I'll never forget and said, Curtis, we're going to change the world. Undeniable advantage over a 401k or even a traditionally overfunded index universal life insurance contract because the idea of exponential growth applies everywhere except for the fact that life insurance specifically eliminates a negative number in that math equation. So exponential growth is really good in any type of vehicle you save with but if you can take a loss or a negative number in terms of a return then that's going to dramatically impact that math equation, right? So life insurance as a whole, index universal life insurance has this 0% floor which automatically gives it an advantage for exponential growth because instead of taking a loss, you just have a flat line in that year and you keep growing from that point forward. So there's an obvious advantage. MPI compared to traditional overfunded index universal life as an additional advantage for exponential growth because what we're doing is actually every several years stepping up the contract by leveraging leverage, if there's, if, for lack of a better definition, right? So if we leverage leverage, then we're squeezing out additional rates of return. And the internal rate of return on your money is then maximized at that point. So exponential growth has the most capability of performing for you in an MPI strategy compared to virtually everything else that, that you could choose from. Using the same data over the last 35 years of returns in the S&P 500, now applying the $400 a month to the MPI Secure Compound Interest Account, your plan could produce up to $108,000 of annual tax-free retirement income. Compare that to the 401k with a 50% match at an underwhelming $51,000. Even with a 100% company match, the 401k would produce an estimated $68,000 of annual retirement income. MPI is so much better in that it maximizes the value of what exponential growth really represents. So exponential growth is the ability to compound your interest time over time over time, right? And there's value in compounded interest. But if your math equation for compounded interest has a negative number, so let's say the market goes down one year and you're exposed to that loss, then that's obviously gonna dramatically impact, impact the value of exponential growth. MPI eliminates that from happening by allowing you not only to take advantage of exponential growth, i.e. compounded interest time over time, but it takes away the negative numbers, takes away the negative impact of market downturns. So your exponential growth is essentially supercharged. Which is completely opposite of the way the financial system works out there today. So when you try to say how much better is it, it's, it's almost hard to quantify. And when you're able to accomplish that, there's really no ceiling. It just depends on how much you're able to contribute, how much that compound interest can really take off. And then when you introduce the leverage uh, element of it, it starts to multiply beyond anything that, that the traditional system can offer. So when people ask me, how is it possible that MPI achieves these results? I educate them that money only needs three things to be very efficient, but more importantly, maximize the compounding effects, security, growth, and leverage. If you don't have all three, you're not getting the full value of your hard-earned money. If you can protect your money inside of a life insurance retirement plan, grow your money inside the S&P 500, and then securely leverage your money through the MPI strategy, full retirement can be achieved potentially 10 to 15 years sooner than the 401k or Roth IRA, previously thought of as impossible. So the average consumer out there is overwhelmed with facts and numbers and spreadsheets, um, but, but the reality is all you have to do is really get to know somebody 
and customize those solutions to them. And, and right now I think that that's the opportunity for people like Curtis Ray and, and myself who are looking to really get down and dirty, so to speak, with individual consumers, teach them what they need to know about retirement. If a consumer is properly educated, they're gonna find that ensuring their retirement is far more important than just stashing money away in a 401k. So my ultimate goal is to help everyone understand the retirement you deserve and dream of is not only possible, but simple through the power of compound interest. If you can pay yourself first, get your money working in a secure compound interest account, and then be disciplined and give it time to grow, wealth and financial freedom can be achieved by anyone. What is retirement to you? You worked 40 years of your life. You were told that if you invested in a 401k Roth IRA, you'd be able to retire. The golden years are here you finally earned it. You have $500,000 in your retirement plan and you go to your financial advisor and ask him, what is my retirement income? And he tells you $20,000 a year. What do you do now? Everyone ends up poor.